Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to our second webinar in a series of live talks on stability, helping us to find inner peace and stillness this Lent right where we are. My name is Rachel McKendry. I'm the book publicist here at Paraclete. Thank you so much for joining us. Our conversation this evening is with Michael Patrick O'Brien and Kathleen Norris. And thanks to both of you so much for taking the time to have this conversation with us tonight. It's so wonderful to see you. Now, just uh, for a quick introduction, Mike O'Brien is a Catholic writer and lawyer living in Salt Lake City. He wrote for his college newspaper while earning a government and theology degree from the University of Notre Dame. And he wrote movie reviews during law school at the University of Utah. Mike is a partner at the law firm of Jones Waldo, Halbrook, and McDonough. He's married to Vicki, a preschool teacher, and they have three adult children and one very cute grandson whom I've seen on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Mike is the author of Monastery Mornings, My Unusual Boyhood Among the Saints and Monks. And Kathleen, Kathleen Norris is an award-winning poet, writer, and author of New York Times bestsellers, The Cloister Walk, Acedia and Me, a Marriage, Monks, and a Writer's Life, Dakota, a Spiritual Geography, Amazing Grace, a Vocabulary of Faith, and The Virgin of Bennington. Exploring the spiritual life, her work is at once intimate and historical, rich in poetry and meditation, brimming with exasperation and reverence, deeply grounded in both nature and spirit, sometimes funny, always provocative. Kathleen is an oblate of Assumption Abbey, a Benedictine Abbey in North Dakota. For anyone who wasn't able to join us right now, I'm already seeing some comments about different time zones and things. Don't worry, um, we'll make sure this available. This video is available on YouTube later on so people can watch it whenever is convenient for them. Uh, please just take a moment, if you will, and find the chat bar or the Q&A button. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on those throughout our conversation tonight. So if you have a thought or a question, please feel free to share it and we'll hope to get to everyone before the end of our hour together. So without any further ado, uh, we'll, we'll begin here. Now, both of you have been connected to a monastery for many years in, in very different ways. And um, would love to hear from each of you about that, how that came to be. Mike, um, we'll start with you and Holy Trinity Abbey in Utah. Yes, hi, Rachel. And uh, uh, I need to say I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to be on the same panel with uh, Kathleen. Uh, she's a tremendous writer and poet. Uh, one of her books is my Lenten reading right now, The Cloister Walk. So if you haven't seen that book, go out and get it right away. Um, you know, like most good things in my life, we, we stumbled on our monastery experience. It was early 1970s. I was a, a, a boy, probably 10 or 11. And uh, my mom uh, and I and my siblings had just gone through a terrible divorce. Uh, it, was, it was a traumatic event for our family. And mom was of a generation where she, she liked to go for rides. Uh, and gas was only 25 cents a gallon, right? That's, that's an interesting fact to know right now, especially. Uh, but back then, gas was 25 cents a gallon, so it was a relatively inexpensive form of entertainment. And one day, in the middle of this divorce turmoil, she said, let's take a ride. So we did, and we ended up in a beautiful place called Huntsville in a, a, a rural valley near Ogden, Utah, northern Utah. And we saw a sign that said monastery, and it had an arrow pointing in a certain direction. And like good Irish Catholics, we followed the sign, and we saw another one that said monastery this way. And we followed that one and entered the gates of Abbey of the Holy Trinity, a Trappist monastery near Huntsville, drove up this beautiful hill. I like to call it Abbey Road uh, to in tribute to my Beatles uh, uh, friends. And uh, we came upon this Quonset hut building, uh, the monastery, the bookstore was open. We walked in and there was a tall lanky monk behind the counter and mom was looking for something. I don't remember what she was looking for, but she said, can I tell you what I'm looking for? And the monk interrupted her and said, well, I know what you're looking for, the same as the rest of us, peace. And uh, it was a striking moment. And to steal a line from Casablanca, it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And for the next dozen years or so, from roughly age 11 to 23, 
Uh, I was up at the monastery two to three times a week. Uh, the monks took me under their wing. Uh, I, I worked on their farm in their bookstore, uh, became good friends with them, and had this whole formative experience that I didn't realize I was having at the time. Uh, uh, so again, I built a career and a life on it's better to be lucky than to be good. And this was an example of uh, a, a very lucky stroke for a family that was dealing with difficult times. Thanks, Mike. And Kathleen, I, I know you're an oblate at Assumption Abbey. Yeah, and that, that again, stumbling across this place is exactly what happened to me. My husband and I had driven past it's their, their tower. They have a, twin towers that are visible, bell towers are visible from the interstate. And we drove past it several times. And my husband, well, that has to be a Catholic church. He was raised Catholic. Now, my ancestry is totally Protestant. The first Protestant ministers we've traced date back to the late 15th century. And my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my brother are all Protestant ministers, right? So I had, I had no understanding of, of Catholicism at all, uh, except through my husband, who was Irish Catholic. But um, one day I found this brochure in, in the Presbyterian pastor's house and I said, oh, this sounds really interesting. Carol Bly, a wonderful writer from Minnesota, was doing a program over, uh, I think it was one overnight, like, you know, two days in an overnight at this place called Assumption Abbey. And I said, this sounds really good. And they agreed. And of course, out, out there in the Western Dakotas, to drive 90 miles to hear somebody give a reading is nothing because they're so rare. Things like that are really quite rare. And I had read Carol Bly and I said, let's just go. So I, so I went up with these Presbyterian pastors and uh, th their church overwhelmed me. It's a big giant, you know, uh, cake box of, of a church with angels that look like Rita Hayworth. I mean, it's really this insane place. A, a, Hungarian, you know, a Hungarian artist had painted these things. Um, and I, I, get, I wake up pretty early. So I was out walking early in the morning and I realized this church doors were open and the monks were at the back in their choir. Uh, and I didn't even know what they were doing. I didn't know they were reciting the Psalms. I mean, I knew nothing about them. And then when it turned out, I was kind of interested in joining them for morning prayer. I, I, that's when I discovered the great Benedictine value of hospitality that, oh yeah, well, come and join us. You can, in that place, you can actually sit with the monks in their choir. They, they don't separate the guests out and they don't have a lot of guests. And that really, again, was the beginning of, of an absolutely beautiful friendship. And I love that that comment about peace. It reminded me of after the cloister walk came out, and of course, journalists have a weird way of, of using putting things and using headlines in the hallway at St. John's Abbey in Minnesota, where I was in residence there at the Institute, um, an institute. They post news articles that mention the Abbey. And there was this one woman discovers peace at monastery. And I, and, I, and I saw that and I kind of laughed. I said, oh, that's, that's really rich. And an old monk was walking by and he said, hmm, he said, that's interesting. I've been here 60 years and I haven't found it yet. <laughs> yeah, that was another thing that, that's, that's self-deprecating humor that is just irresistible. Uh, hospitality and humor are, are big in my book. So that that's kind of what happened and I, I I, when I realized that they had a great library, these people in North Dakota had a great library, they were willing to loan me books, I could, I could go up there for overnight visits and, and attend, you know, re recite the Psalms with them. Um, that was it. And of course, they're Roman Catholic, I was married, celibate man, I'm a married Protestant woman. So it didn't make any sense at all. But because I, I really was attracted to their liturgy, the monks decided that, you know, that this was fine, this was good. And it was, and it is. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much. Mike, you, you mentioned that you're reading Kathleen's book, The Cloister Walk, about stability, monastic stability for those of us who live outside an abbey. And um, you, you send us this quotation, if, if you don't mind if I read it. In a marriage, in a small town, in a monastery, it is all too easy to let things slide, to allow tensions to build until the only way they can be relieved is an explosion that does more harm than good. Benedict's voice remains calm, persevere, bear one another's burdens, be patient with one another's infirmities of body or behavior. And when the thorns of contention arise in daily life, daily forgive and be willing to accept forgiveness. 
Remember that you are not the center of the universe, but to use Benedict's words, keep death daily before your eyes. Mm -hmm. And I love that, you know, Benedict pointing us to calm, perseverance, humble, forgiving spirit as the best way to approach our relationships. Um, and, and as the remedy for the difficult encounters that we can all, you know, expect day-to-day -day life. Um, and would you, would you be willing to share about, you know, how, how do you apply that to your daily life, to your marriage relationship? You're both married, um, your working relationships. How, how do you put that into practice? Go ahead, Kathleen. That's your beautiful writing. Well, thank you. Yeah, and and I think um, I think for me, and I think for many people, this the stability that you get can come from your family if you're lucky. Again, there's that word luck, and I. But I remember one of the things that struck me when I was uh, considering becoming an oblate at Assumption, the uh, the, the oblate director, um, retired abbot, wonderful man, and he said, you know, you're living in vows. You have marriage vows, and those are vows that those are sacred vows, just like a monastery vow. And I thought, well, okay, well then, if I'm living in vows, then that the marriage is where I will find my stability, and that really did. And I have, fortunately, I have a family tradition. I think my parents and their parents were all married for over 60 years. So there was that kind of stability in the family to help me understand that that probably was, you know, what I need, where I needed to be. Uh, um, and I think, yeah, that, that's it. I think that's enough for now. Thank you. I have to confess that I had a mixed reaction when I read those words from Kathleen. I, I fell in love with them and I, and I was horribly envious that I had not written them. Um, oh, I know that uh, feeling, I have it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I, what I loved about it was um, people go to monasteries thinking they're these exotic places where saints reside. Um, and in fact, my friend, Father David Altman, who was an abbot there at Holy Trinity, used to say that you know the key component of success in a monastery is about a rela relationships and he said you, you're constantly working on and trying to develop relationships and you have terribly awful failings at that and you have wonderful successes just like you do outside in the world mm -hmm. um and he said but the key is to to work on the relationships so this notion of of stability that i loved expressed in kathleen's words was um you know, it's not boom and you've got it, right? It's something you have to keep working for. And it's something that you have to contribute to. You have to forgive others and you better hope that people forgive you too um, because you're gonna step in it yourselves. So Father David said, how do you adjust to living life in a monastery? He said, it's like a flea eating an elephant. Uh, you do it one bite at a time. Uh, so I, I, I think the remarkable notion of stability is, is community and, and community comes with uh, understanding, tolerating and forgiving each other. And I think that's what Catherine's writing so wonderfully expresses. Yeah. And for well, me, like, oh, go ahead. Me, I think um, understanding what stability really meant all did center in relationships because I very quickly realized getting to know that community intimately in North Dakota was that these were really very ordinary people living in an extraordinary way, called to live that way and trying to live that way. Yes. And the Albert director, the former abbot said when he was a, when he was a novice, and this had been, you know, 50 years before, somebody had told a lie to the abbot about him and he found out about it and he decided the best thing to do was to just wait it out, to not complain, not make a fuss, just you know, go about his business, being who he was, doing what he was doing, and eventually the abbot would see that this was not true. Hmm. Then he said, of course, it took 10 years, but what's 10 years to a monk? And I went, <laughs> oh, that's okay. Now, this is something I've, no, what's 10 years? You can't, you know, hmm. can't leap in. And, and again, and, and of course, the relationship we had with that abbot was probably much richer than it would have been if he had jumped in to try to defend himself and, dis and disparage the other person, all of that. Um, and then I also observed things that happened where one young monk um, who had a lot of father issues joined the monastery and immediately sort of projected his anger at his own father on another monk who didn't deserve it. And I knew both of the guys. I knew they weren't really speaking to each other. And again, uh, they waited out. 
Mm-hmm. They just go about their business. And, and eventually those two guys began to understand, hey, this guy isn't so bad. Oh, this guy isn't so bad. And they never became, you know, bosom, you know, really buddies or anything, but they respected each other and they could live with each other. And just watching those things uh, happen over time was really fascinating to me in terms of human psychology and behavior. It seems like the the hospitality and humor that you were talking about a minute ago ties into all of that because if we're if we're being hospitable to each other even in those relationships and if we're keeping our sense of humor and probably humility too oh. that stability becomes a whole lot more possible I, I would think yeah that's great yeah Rebecca says we could use a little more waiting out on Twitter these days yeah I think that's true well that that is so true I I, I mean. <laughs> I, I really, I enjoy social media. I enjoy many aspects of it, but uh, you see so many instances where people rush to conclusions and assume things. And but even, you know, you post an article and they don't read the article and then they say something that in their comments that would have been revealed if they had read the article. Um, it, you know, it, 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 there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of damage that can be done from speaking without thinking first. And I think I think one of the things that monks learn and, and sisters in, in a monastery is is to sort is to think first before they speak. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's true. And both of you, um, in your experience with the monasteries, you know, so different, and yet you you learned so much of the same things. Um, and I, you know, from my experience too, it really it's it's an extended family. Um, Kathleen, for you as an oblate, Mike, for you literally as as your family members, and and to these monks who became like dads to you in in many ways. Yes. Um, and I I I I know you're both members of local churches as well, and um, I wonder if you could talk about you know what's different about your connection to the monastery um, that that's different from your parish family, and and how can those two worlds sort of um, inform each other or, or benefit each other? No, great, great question. Uh, I, I'm in a wonderful parish, St. Thomas More uh, in Cottonwood Heights, Utah, a perfect parish for a lawyer, right? Uh, and it, it is a wonderful community, but it's different from the monastery. Um, you know, the monastery was like home, where, you know, where you could let your hair down and be yourself. At least it was for me because I spent so much time there and got to know them so well. Whereas in church, um, it's a wonderful community, but I, I'm always, you know, in my church clothes and on my best behavior. Um, and, you know, in our parish, at least I haven't been able to develop the sort of day-to-day relationship with the community and, and our, our wonderful parish priests that I did with the monks. Uh, because again, you know, we're, we're there on a much more limited basis. And, you know, God bless them, our, our Catholic priests today are spread so thin uh, that it's, it's, it's hard enough for them to, to do their ministry job, let alone do the sort of, you know, day by day, hour by hour pastoral care that, that uh, you know, I experienced as a boy in, in our parishes and, and at the monastery. So mm-hmm. wonderful experiences, uh, glimpses of what I, I, I had at the monastery, but the monastery will always be my spiritual home, um, uh, just because, uh, like I said, I could let my hair down there and and you know like the, the phrase they use in their vow of stability is they uh, I, I like this language it says by our vow of stability we promise to commit ourselves for life to one community of brothers and sisters with whom we will work out our salvation in faith hope and love uh, we gradually entrust ourselves to god mercy experienced in the company of brothers or sisters who know us and accept us as we are hmm. uh, and that happens to a degree in parishes but for me, the, the place where that happened most was at Holy Trinity Abbey in Humstrom. I think one of the things that actually I was kind of depressed by this at the time, I thought, oh, no, this is, this is not good. I realized that the monks, I was very close to the monks, but it realized that they really could not be my Christian community. I needed, if I was going to be an oblate, I needed to join a church. And the oblate director agreed with, he said he was, he was glad I had realized that. And I had to join the join the little Presbyterian church in Lemon, which was had been my grandmother's church. There were a lot of, and it worked out fine, but I always kind of felt a little bit aloof uh, from it to some degree. But 
but they asked me to preach, you know, they, they, when, when, when they were between uh, pastors and those kinds of things. Um, and since I spend a lot of time in Honolulu these days where, where I went to high school, I actually have a wonderful Episcopal church that I go to, which I love the liturgy. And one of the great ironies of my life, I've been laughing at myself and I laughed when I got the invitation about stability because after 35 years as a Benedictine oblate, I'm finally discovering the value of stability in, in at least one sense, because I haven't been traveling. Mm. I've come over the last year, uh, you know, I stopped traveling a hundred thousand miles a year because if you live in Hawaii, you rack up the miles pretty fast. Yeah. Work, work, travel, mostly work and some family things on the mainland. But I was here and I was able to to have a, even with Zoom, I was able to have a much deeper relationship with my church family. And I'm on the member of the prayer chain, which as an oblate makes sense because prayer is so important. I'm on this little group. We pray together. We meet together once a month. And, and we've just gotten very close and, and we frustrate each other. We, we exasperate each other sometimes, but we we hang in there. And there was an el- one of the older members in her 90s had to, had to uh, go to the DMV to get a, um, a state ID because your driver's license expired. And of course, we volunteered to take her, you, you know, yeah. in the middle of the pandemic, it wasn't a lot of fun, but that's just the kind of thing you do for a member of your family, a member of your community. Mm-hmm. So all of those things, uh, I really, um, and, and one woman said to me, she said, it's so nice really getting to know you because before it was like you were visiting. And I said, that's how I felt too. And I'm really relieved. And I should say in Hawaii, you don't have to wear church clothes. You can pretty much wear whatever you want to <laughs> It's, you don't have to dress like a grown up here. And I know one attorney, I know one attorney in town. He doesn't do courtroom work. The only time I've ever seen him in long pants is at a funeral. It's <laughs> the, whole during, thing, the whole world. Yeah. During yeah. Uh, during the pandemic, I made the wonderful discovery that you actually can practice law while wearing Birkenstocks. So that was a revelation. Uh, <laughs> But how interesting, you know, going back to, um, I can't remember exactly when you said it, Kathleen, but that idea that like, you you know, people see the monks who aren't familiar with the monastery and they think, oh, they're saints, they're so holy, but perhaps stability and developing stability and living out stability is in the little things, taking each other to the DMV, caring, caring for those little needs. And, and so maybe there are more ways than we think in the parish to, to keep on um, developing those stable roots together. Yeah. Another thing that happened was, and again, I think this is how church is supposed to be. And I think the pandemic helped make it possible. It may have always been possible and I just didn't see it, but there was another person um, a little bit older and in her eighties and she needed to five weeks of radiation, five days a week. Mm-hmm. And the reaction was, we're not going to let you do this alone. And so we, we set up a schedule. So, and I was one of the people doing this, that people would take her to her radiation treatments, pick her up at home, drive her back. And towards the end, when she got a little tired, she did very well, but when she would get tired, we'd, we'd stop by and pick up some food meals. So she wouldn't have to cook meals for herself because she lives a widow. She lives alone, but th- that instinct, Oh, we're not letting you do. We don't want you to do this by yourself. Mm-hmm. Be part of this community this is what this means and I remember thinking wow okay this is community yeah, yeah. It, it certainly adds to my sense of stability in that community that this is the kind of place where this can happen yeah um, um it was last week that Nathan Oates was talking about um the Cistercian brothers and um I'm gonna say the wrong thing Tiberine where um Oh, yeah. Instead of seeing themselves as the birds who are flying away, they realized, no, we're the branch that the birds can perch on. We're, we, we need to be there for our brothers and sisters as much as we need to be there for ourselves. So that's... Um, if, I think it was one of the Muslim villagers who told Yes, them, who said that, yeah. Yep. You know, you're the branch for us. And they were, and it, it, it's a tragic thing that, that happened. Mm-hmm. That, that's a lovely image. It, it reminds me of uh, the monks now. There's three of them, of the Utah monks left. And of course, they're all in their late 80s or early 90s. And they're in a retirement home here in Salt Lake. So they're actually closer to me than they've ever been, uh, she, uh, you know, uh, uh, physically. And, you know, they, I, I, once in a while, I take them to doctor appointments. And I was talking with Father Patrick Boyle who's from St. Louis, was at Holy Trinity Abbey for 60 years. 
he almost went to Gethsemane when when the Huntsville Monastery closed. Mm -hmm. But he decided to stay here with the other monks who were going to the to the retirement home. And so I asked him, I asked him why. And he said, you know, Mike, uh, my vow of stability is not just to a place. It's to a group of people, too. Um, and he said, I wanted to stay with my brothers. Um, and of course, after I stopped weeping, I, I, uh, uh, I realized what a, what a beautiful statement that was about the notion of community. Um, and it's not just about the stone walls. Um, it, it truly is, you know, the entire tree. It's the branches, it's the leaves. You know, they, they their sense of community and stability is a commitment to the whole place. Uh, and they, they truly do that. He and Father David, they still say the divine liturgy together. And mm -hmm. and uh, um, it, 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 it just is, is it's been wonderful seeing them away from the monastery and sort of establishing their own little branch of it in a new location. I love that. I, I realize I'm, I'm remiss here because um, <laughs> We're, we're, we're speaking with an audience tonight who's perhaps not completely familiar with all the, the Benedictine terms that we throw around. So Kathleen, um, Jennifer is asking, what precisely does an oblate director do? But I wonder if we should rewind and could you tell us what an oblate is? It's a very ancient term. And in, in medieval era, uh, it's an oblate simply means an offering and families would, would park with would pack their extra kids over to a monastery, make them oblates. I mean, that's how it derived, but it is, it does mean offering and you're offering yourself to the monastery to, to basically, um, you're, you're not a member, although the, uh, the uh, you do sign this this vow on the altar during a mass. I mean, it's a quite a dramatic thing, but basically you're, you're saying you're gonna try to follow the rule of Benedict in your life as much as you can. And of course, as a married woman, that's gonna be a lot different than a celibate monk in a community. Mm -hmm. But you're going to try to follow the rule, study the rule um, and remain affiliated with this community. And um, I did it 35 years ago and I, I live at a far, very far distance, but I still feel very close, cl close to that community. Um, and the oblate director uh, basically is the person who gets together with the out he, he you you often take a year or two to study before you become an oblate so you would study with that person many larger monasteries will have monthly meetings some oblates get the ones who live close by get close together of course now they're doing it on zoom too uh, and you know to to have a, one of the monks might come and give them a lecture they come to prayers with the community during that period uh, and then for myself, it was always a matter of making my own personal retreats quite often. So there's a variety of things that happen with oblates. And, and I was the first Protestant oblate at Assumption Abbey. They'd always had Catholic oblates before, but that has become not, a, not an issue of really. Thank you so much. Thank Jennifer, I hope that answers your question. Um, Thanks for all these comments coming in on the, the chat bar, everyone. And I, there's a question in our Q&A and I promise I'll get to that one. Um, I, I would love, um, Kathleen and Mike, if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about um, just sort of another aspect of everyday life for us in, um, in our work. <laughs> you know, um, I think about the, the job culture and work that's not always steady and um, climbing ladders and trying to get better jobs and positions and and even the quality of the work we do. Um, you know, Mike, in the book, you talk about helping them in the bookstore, or helping with the chickens or um, one of my favorite stories, you know, helping w when it was when one of the monks had died and being there and seeing them dig their grave and all that. Um, can you talk about um, that sort of stabilizing influence that you probably learned watching the monks work as a boy and, and, and how does that come into play in your life now as a lawyer? Great questions, yes. So again, you know, uh, we were sort of a family in turmoil, um, you know, with a divorce uh, and uh, my father wasn't present in our lives uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, um, you know, here I am around the 33, uh, you know, uh, men who are, working on a farm and, and, uh, you know, singing and, and planting flowers and, and uh, 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 for some reason, they, they noticed me, um, you know, I, you know, maybe 
you know, maybe I was a surrogate son to them, right? A, a 11 year old boy and 11 year old boys can be kind of interesting. Um, so one of them in particular took me under his wings, Brother Boniface. He was uh, this big, tall, lanky New Jersey uh, native who had uh, been in World War II. And immediately after he left World War II, he went to Gethsemane Abbey in his uniform and joined. Uh, and in 1947, 75 years ago this year, they sent him out to Holy Trinity Abbey. And he became the, the monk I, I knew best. So he'd let me follow him around. Uh, I don't think I added dramatically to the uh, efficiency of the, you know, the work operations he was involved in, but, but he included me. Yeah. Um, he saw me. And, you know, at, at a, an 11 year old boy whose family is going through a divorce uh, doesn't feel seen um, and feels left out. And so that was a very stabilizing moment for me to be seen by somebody who could have been, you know, could have spent his time doing something else. Uh, and it was an example to me of, of, of how to be a father. Because uh, again, with a father outside of my life, I didn't have that day-to-day -day role model. And I realized that one of the best ways to be a father is presence, uh, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, not P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E um, <laughs> presence, being there, because that's that's what, what Brother Boniface did for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other lesson, just quickly, you know, fast forward 50 years, again, I'm talking to Father Patrick at the retirement home. And I said to him, how did, how was it for you to spend 60 years in a monastery and then to be totally uprooted and put in this retirement home? And, and he, he, he's unflappable. And he said to me, you know, I, I, I learned a, a doctrine, a concept that I follow. Uh, it's called the sacrament of the now moment. And he said, the, the past is the past and God will take care of the future. So I have to live in the now moment. Uh, and what, what a concept, right? Because I was living in the now with Brother Boniface 50 years ago. Uh, and then I hear Father Patrick describe it. And now fast forward to my job, you know, the Salt Lake legal market is in turmoil right now. All new firms coming in, a lot of changes. Uh, you know, turmoil within within my own firm. I don't know what our future status will be. And I, I had these monks to look to who were uprooted from their own home after 60 years telling me, don't worry about the, the, the past. It's gone. God will take care of the future. Live in the now moment. And so I, I, right now I'm trying to live in the now moment, despite uh, all of the difficulties um, that, you know, may be swirling around us. So it, remarkable influences that I didn't even know what were happening at the time uh, from just hanging out with these wonderful monks. And for me, uh, the two vows that are unique to Benedictines, and that includes the Cistercians as well, are stability, but also conversion. So you, you, you can have this ground of stability. And I think a lot of it has to do in actually believing that God works all things for the good. And that is ultimate stability. Um, but you also have the vow of conversion, which means being open to change and living in the now, being present, even when it's everything's changing around you. You've got that sort of core of inner stability. And I've seen that. I, I know people whose monasteries have closed and they've moved to other monasteries. Very, very difficult because sometimes these places have become so special to them over the years. They built the stone walls and they've had to leave them. All those things are painful, but but they handle it so beautifully um because of those two vows i think yeah we're we're gonna be we're gonna have our stability here and our faith in god and, and our faith in the community but when things really change around us we have to go with that we can't be rigid and and try to hold on to things yeah this um is a is a good opportunity for a question that has come in from ann she says, could you please say more about stability and a specific place? I have moved around geographically in my life and have not stayed anywhere long enough to think deep roots. I'm wondering if this has been a disadvantage to me. An interesting question. Well, I've moved around a lot and I never expected to be living back in Hawaii, but in a way it's it's been good for me because it has given me more stability. I moved here when I was about 10, when Hawaii was still a territory. and. Um, and then I lived away uh, a lot, uh, went to college and worked on the mainland and then 
even when I was in South Dakota, that was a stable place. That was my summer place as a kid. So there was something there. But I think, you know, you, you, you can still develop some inner stability um, that will help you even when the circumstances around you are changing and you need to move. And I do have a certain level of respect and sometimes even envy for people who do put down roots in a place and are totally rooted there. I mean, the college professor, you walk in, they're emeritus and there's, there's, they've been married 50 years, they've been teaching in the college 50 years and their walls are full of books and, you know, uh, and all of that. And I think, wow, what a life that would have been. But again, it's not my life. So um, I think working, if you are gonna be moving a lot, um, work on inner stability, but also don't dis, don't be discouraged in placing some kind of roots with the community where you are, even if it's going to be temporary. Uh, that making friendships and doing things with other people make your community where you are and and the fact that it might be temporary you know don't let that slow you down mm -hmm. i think that's the key word is community uh, right one of the the wonderful women to visit holy trinity abbey in the early 1970s was dorothy day um mm -hmm. and uh you know of course in in her book the long loneliness she wrote um, we've all known the long loneliness and we've learned that the only solution is love and that love comes with community. Uh, and so I, I think that's one of the universal truths of a monastery uh, is, you know, you, you don't only find stability in a monastery. You don't only find uh, community in a monastery. You can find stability and community anywhere. But I think the key as you translate that monastic vow of stability into an, the life of a non-monk is to find a, a community and, and become part of it. Um, uh, I, I think that's one of the key secrets. Can I ask you, I know Mike that you, you keep, even though Holy Trinity Abbey isn't there, I mean, I mean the land is there and you're doing such a beautiful job of preserving it and, and um, keeping the spiritual life alive there. Um, but Kathleen, you're in Hawaii, Assumption is far away. Do you maintain a relationship there? We have a question from someone who has moved geographically away from the Abbey where they're in Oblate and they're asking, how, how do I maintain those ties? Is there a way to do that? Well, you know, snail mail and email work really well. I actually haven't had Zoom conversations with the monks there, but that's something I might suggest sometime get together because I, I do... I frequently get emails and they I go on their Facebook. I always make comments, you know, with their... their um, um, you know, the name days of the monks and everything. And I always say hello from Oblate Raphael, you know, and, and they know who I am. But just, I, I, I never felt like I really lost touch. I, and, and of course, my idea of a perfect vacation is to go there on a retreat. And I will do that sometimes, or, or go to St. John's Abbey in Minnesota, where I also spent some time, uh, quite a bit of time and, and got to know that community very well. So uh, I think all my, almost all my Christmas cards now come from monks and nuns. I mean, it, <laughs> And, and that's me, very that's very cool I, <laughs> we you know and and um so I, there are the ties that you can try to maintain but if you can possibly get there once a year or once every two years to just you know submerge yourself in that liturgy again and remind yourself why this community is doing what they're doing all of that i mean that is my idea of a perfect vacation i love that yeah um Okay, this is an interesting question um, from Ruth. She says, is stability always a geographical place or can it be an internal space? She says, what you are describing sounds very Buddhist. Yeah. You know, when I wrote the Cloister Rock, one of the best responses I got was from a Zen Buddhist monastery, in, uh, I think in either Washington or Oregon. And they said, we love your book. You've described our life very well. I <laughs> There are, there are, the, the, the laws is very different, but there are a lot of similarities in the values, the kinds of stability that comes um, in, in the way they live. And mm -hmm. so, uh, it, you know, the, Thomas Merton, of course, died at, at one of those first um, Buddhist Christian dialogues, but it's been going on since the 60s. I mean, they exchange program, everything. So the Benedictines and Buddhists often recognize kindred spirits there. And I do think there's inner stability um, 
that, that really does matter. And I think part of it, I think um, living with uncertainty, which we all do all the time, but sometimes there are situations like medical issues arise and everything. And if you ever deal with doctors, you know that medicine is, is a, a lot of it's a crapshoot. You know, they don't, they don't have answers, definitive answers. You're living with all this uncertainty. And I think, um, and, and actually I'm going through some of that now. And I think my doctor can't believe I'm not more upset. And I kind of go, well, you know, these monks have a way of getting, you know, getting into you here. This is like, no, I, I'm not losing sleep over this because this is just my favorite theologian, the George Carlin, the church of what's happening now. And, um, you know, it, and I think but if I hadn't discovered the Benedictines and really become an oblate and tried to follow their rule for all these years, I think I would be a basket case right now. I would, I wouldn't be handling a number of things. I would say easily, but I think as with the kind of stability that I'm finding, that I'm discovering that I actually have in the last year or so. The last uh, abbot of Holy Trinity Abbey was Father Brendan Freeman. I know him. Yes, uh, wonderful man. He's now at New Melloray. And when, uh, when, he, when he helped shepherd the closing of, of the Huntsville Monastery, he wrote an article for Cistercian Quarterly called To Close a Monastery, which is a beautiful article. I recommend it to anyone. Um, and at, at the end of that, he referred to what he re said is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say it as eloquently as he did, but he talked about our only true monastery is the monastery of the heart. Um, and I, I think that's completely true. I mean, stability can be to a place, of course, it can be to people like Father Patrick said. Um, uh, but ultimately, you know, as we move, we have to reestablish those bonds. Um, and maybe those, the only place will be in our heart that we take from one place to another. Hmm. I'm glad to know he's back at New Mallory because I, I want to get in touch with him again. He's a wonderful writer and I believe I read that piece, but now I want to look it up again. Yes, it, 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 it's excellent. Um, Gloria is asking, she says, our Benedictine monastery is no longer able to support the oblate community. We are beginning the process of where to go from here. And do you have any suggestions? Oh, I'm curious about that. I know, I know some monasteries have closed and have done, that have closed, have oblates have gone to other monasteries, but I've never really heard of, I'm not sure what she means by supporting. I mean, maybe not being able to have them come on retreats or have the group meetings that they used to have. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there's some people she should get in touch with. Um, uh, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to turn my phone back on and find the link for her. Cause okay. I think there's a bunch of people talking about some of these issues. Uh, yeah. for, we, we've been, we met all through the pandemic. In fact, um, I just have to just see if I can get their email for her because I think she would find some very, some people to talk to. So let me, okay. let me turn my phone back on it. <laughs> Well, while you're doing that, another recommendation has come in saying um, to, to look at the website, website, excuse me, beingbenedictine.com, because there's lots of um, information and opportunities there. That's it. In fact, Saturday, they're having a big meeting. They don't, you don't even have to register for it. If you go to beingbenedictine.com, I guess it is, is it org or com? Uh, she says beingbenedictine.com, but I'm not 100% sure. Double check. We'll, we'll try to find out, and when we send out our follow-up email, we'll um, we'll make sure we give you the right thing. And um, Mary Jo says there's an online monastery group at Sacred Heart Monastery in Yankton. So, so that's one of the you know strange mixed blessings of the pandemic is that we we really are more connected than ever over things like Zoom. Like here we all are tonight. Um, having lost uh, the having lost our monastery here, one of the ways we've uh, compensated is uh, I call it the, the monk nerd club. Um, I, I, I've, I've made many, many new friends that I didn't know uh, prior to writing this book of people who have the same wonderful experiences at Holy Trinity Abbey. And we have this informal network where we, you know, talk and reminisce about the monks and share stories. And a number of them are not even Catholic. In fact, the man who owns the, the property now and is preserving it, Bill White, is not is not a Catholic, but um, you know, part of the way we continue that 
that relationship with the monastery is through each other. Uh, it, it drives our wives crazy sometimes when we go to dinner and all we talk about are, are Trappist monks. But um, you know that the, the, the those sorts of the spirits live within the people who knew them too. And and so you know, much like uh, you know, this is uh, maybe a bit of a stretch, but you know, much like the you know the early Christians had to find a way to adapt to a life without Jesus. Um, after he he died and, and rose, they you know they found it in each other, um, and uh, you know with the monastic movement struggling right now, I think it's going to be people like us, people like Kathleen, who and, and all of our friends and people who are interested in 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 monasticism, uh, who will become that uh, that source of uh, how to talk about monks, even though monasteries have closed. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge thing because I don't think anything can really replace these people who spend five or six or seven years in formation and live together in a community. There's no real substitute for that. And I think I think monasteries have been around for 1700 years, so I don't think they're all going to go away. I think we're going to still have that some form of that traditional monastery, but being it, it is being Benedictine at gmail.com. That is great. That, they're having a program Saturday. You don't even have to register. You can just find the link and join. And one of the topics is, you know, what, what do you do when your monastery closes or those things? There is a group called Monasteries of the Heart that doesn't have a physical location. I'm not sure how well that would, I, I don't think I would like that, but I, I, I know for some people it works really well. So there's a lot of uh, fermentation and experimentation and talk going on because communities know that they're at risk of closing. And they often will join another larger monastery and keep mm -hmm. that. Um, there have been some beautiful examples of, of that working very, very well. But it has some oblates do feel um, kind of left out. They, they, they have a real hard time because they've gotten very close to a community. And when it closes, it, it can be very painful for them and the monastic people, too. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've talked about um, stability, obviously, and, and we touched on conversion a little bit. Um, but again, for, for, for those of us who, who don't live inside the cloister, how, how about those other, those other vows, poverty and obedience? Actually, I don't think Benedictines take the vow of poverty, I think, but, but it's, it's implicit in the rule that they're not to own things, you know, that they don't own things. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's very countercultural. It's very un-American to not want to buy more stuff, but I think, um, for me, the monks have always been a good example of not following the trends, either in thought, in thinking or in, in terms of products. You know, do you really need this new thing? Is it really new and improved? Um, they've helped me there anyway. Um, the Trappists do take vows of poverty and obedience. And um, I, I'm not the most obedient person in the world and I'm obviously not poor. Uh, so I had to translate those vows, just like I have tried to translate the other vows. And for me, poverty means trying to live a more simple life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Brother Boniface, the monk I mentioned earlier, when we would go up there, he would give my mother envelopes full of, of cash. And, you know, they weren't payoffs or kickbacks. Um, she would send them to India, to the, to the, uh, the, the leper colony in Hawaii, uh, to uh, all these different places of people who would write to the monks and ask for help. And mom was a conduit for sending it. And so, you know, years later, I was, I was watching It's a Wonderful Life. And there's that line where, you know, Clarence the Angel talks about not using money in heaven. And George Bailey says, well, it comes in real handy down here, bub. Uh, and it reminded me of the monastery because they had money, but they took a vow of poverty. In fact, there was a monk giving my mother, you know, wads of cash in an envelope that she would distribute to people who needed it. And I think the lesson I took from that in, in terms of poverty is that that money is is a tool we can use to uh, to to bring the light of, of, of Christ into the world. Um, and that's certainly what those monks did. And in terms of obedience. You know, I, 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 I struggled with translating that one until I found, a, I'm not a Hebrew or a Greek scholar, but I stumbled on a website that said the original word for obedience actually also means to listen. And I, and I thought, wow, that's what that is, right? I, I, I don't have a vow of obedience as a non-monk, but 
uh, I can certainly listen better to other people, uh, to my family, to my friends, uh, to my clients as a lawyer. Um, so I, th th that's how I've tried to, to deal with those vows in my own life is be more simple and listen better. And, and the monastics I know have been an inspiring example of that where people who listen so well, they're hearing what you're not saying as well as what you say. They've, right, right. That stability in monastic community has taught them how to listen really, really well. And I, I'm not sure I'm a very good listener, but I'm trying because they've made me aware that that is really important. I, I, I'm, I, I know how I feel when I know I've been really listened to, and I want to be able to provide that for other people. And, and sometimes when that has worked, it has led to some incredible conversations with people I never really thought I liked or never even thought I would ever get to know but because I listened to them it, it's it's very important it is yeah that is the the origin of, of the word obedience Helen Helena's reminding us about St. Benedict's words to listen with the ear of the heart listen imagine how hard that is for a lawyer um you know because we lawyers you know we often the way we listen is is uh, to either wait until someone's done talking so we can say what we want to say or to figure out how to rebut what they're saying. So, you know, certainly listening in the, in the monastic sense of it is, is something I struggle with and try to work on. Um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, my wife, Vicki, can give you a report card as to how well I'm doing. Um, hopefully she'll be gentle. But I would think with clients, it would be very valuable because sometimes people come with what they think is their legal problem and it's actually something else. Yeah, 100% correct. Mm -hmm. So true. He Heidi um, asked this at the beginning of our time together and I, I told her we'd get to her, but um, in terms of putting it into practice, if, if, if you're not an oblate, if that's if not an option that's you know local to you or it doesn't seem like the right direction, how how do we put these lessons about stability particularly um, into our church life, into our into our local parish life? I, I'm not good at, at, at telling people what to do. So maybe I'll answer that by saying what I think I can do. You know, in, in terms of my own parish, I think what I need to do is invest myself more into it. Um, you know, to I, I'm a part of the community, uh, but I can be a real part of the community. Um, you know, I, I need to sort of devote myself to my parish the way I did to the monks into the monastery. Um, uh, and again, that doesn't have to be a, a church. You know, you can have a community at work that you invest yourself into or a community of friends, because I think ultimately that's what stability is, is about community. Um, I, I don't see or understand God in any mystical way. Um, I see God in the faces of other people and in the actions of other people. I, I'm not blessed uh, as a mystic. So the only way I can come to know God is through, you know, the doctrine we call the incarnation, which is God is in all of us. Um, so if I'm investing time in you and in the community that you are and I are in together, I, I think I'm doing uh, the basic thing that monks refer to as uh, fulfilling the vow of stability. Yeah. Going to the golden oldie, an ancient monk, Irenaeus, said the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And I think, you know, that's um, those are the people that, you know, they're fully alive because they have invested themselves in something bigger than themselves. They've invested in community, whatever it is, if it's a church group, uh, even a trade union, uh, some group that's doing trying to do some good in the world. Um, and families too, you invest yourself, you don't hold back, you really invest yourself. <clears throat> and then you discover all kinds of, of things about yourself and about other people. And I do think that is God working in us and in the world. Mm -hmm. Jack says, with the number of monks and monasteries decreasing, what do you see as the future model for lay people who want to live a monastic life in the active world? Well, well, let's start with by reading Kathleen's book, The Cloister Walk. Um, uh, that's a, a, a wonderful, I, I'm, as I said, I'm about halfway through it, and I feel like I'm walking with her at St. John's Abbey as she's in residence there. Um, you know, if, if you don't have a chance to know monks like we've been blessed to do, I think you have to discover them another way, um, monks or, or, or sisters who live in community. Um, we had a wonderful community of Benedictines here in, in Utah that I knew very well too. 
Um, and, uh, you know, you have to, you have to, it's not going to be as easy to stumble upon monasteries uh, for the next several years as it was for me or for Kathleen. And, and so, uh, you know, we're going to have to compensate those of us who are, who are looking to that example. And I'll recommend a book that actually helped me when I was thinking of becoming an oblate. Um, and a monk recommended her, Esther Duvall, D-E-W-A-A-L. And she's an Anglican woman, um, British. She wrote a book called Seeking God, which is just wonderful because she is an oblate herself in England. And her second book I like even better called Living with Contradiction. And it's just, a, I, I realized that the worldview that she gained through her connection with the Benedictines was one that I could adopt no matter what I was doing or where I was living. So I think Seeking God and Living with Contradiction are two books. And I guess, you know, studying the rule of getting together with other people to study the rule uh, finding people who used to be monks or sisters. I mean, there's a lot of them out there that, uh, you know, went through formation and, and have some valuable insights and stuff. Just, uh, but I think studying and, but again, seeking some form of community might be the best way to, to sort of keep that monastic spirit alive, even when you can't be affiliated with the monastery. My friend Bill White, who, who's taking care of the monastery land now, and I, we have this sort of fantasy dream of 50 years from now, somebody walking down Abbey Road at the monastery, and there's farming going around like the monks did, and that person perhaps will be reading my book, um, uh, reading about the men uh, who lived there, you know, 50 years before. Um, you know, it's going to be a, a derived, a derivative experience. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote the book because these monks were too uh, modest to tell their own story, but their story needs to be told. It needs to be remembered. They need to be remembered and loved. And if people only love them and remember them through the written word, that's the next best thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. The, the, the chat bar is just full of comments and questions. And um, I promise everyone that we'll in our, our follow-up email, we'll we'll try to um, share as much of this information as we can. Okay, really quickly, Jesus Ramon says, Michael mentioned a club. Can he share more about it? And if he knows of clubs, we can join. <laughs> a, a club is a, it, it's probably more of a joke. We call it the monk nerd club. It, it's my friends who uh, know the monastery and had experiences there and we get together informally. Um, <clears throat> I try to blog about those stories uh, from time to time as well, um, but I, I, unfortunately, I don't know, a, a, maybe we should start one. I don't know of a, <laughs> of a good Huntsville Monastery Club I could recommend to them. Again, I think being Benedictine, the being Benedictine, yeah. because you have a lot of monastic people are in that, but also people like me and people who are just interested in monasticism, it's a, it would be a great site for you to go to. Being Benedictine at gmail.org. Okay. Saturday, and, there's a, 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 a long online Zoom meeting. We'll, we'll be sure to share that link in our follow-up email, everyone. And, and I'm so sorry, but we're really coming to the end of our hour together. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thanks to all of you who have um, been part of our conversation tonight. And um, I'm saving the chat now so that if there's anybody I missed, hopefully I, I, we can find a way to get back to you. Thank you for all your comments and participation. Um, we sadly, Paraclete does not publish Kathleen's book, but we do publish Monastery Mornings. And we um, at Paraclete, we always encourage you to go to your local bookstore to find these treasures um, as you know, part of um, an encouragement to help you get these resources for yourself, maybe for your parish, maybe um, for your group of friends who are more interested in the monastic life. Please visit our website, paracletepress.com. If you use uh, the coupon code STABILITY, you'll get 20% off your purchase of Mike's book and the other books that are featured in our stability series this Lent. Um, I hope you'll, you'll consider joining us again next Wednesday night. We're gonna talk with um, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. He's the author of The Wisdom of Stability. Um, and that will be a conversation on stability and personal spiritual growth. Um, Paracletepress.com is our website. Again, someone's asking, but we'll send you a follow-up email. So all that information will be there, not to worry. 
And um, then again, excuse me, on, uh, on April 6th, Father Ron Rollheiser will be with us. He's written a fantastic little book called Domestic Monastery. And um, for those of us like myself at home with kids wondering, you know, I, I, I don't have the benefit of being in the cloister. How do I do this? Um, he's got some wonderful, encouraging and practical tips for the monastic life at home, even surrounded by little kiddos. <laughs> so again, thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Kathleen, Mike, so, so wonderful to be with you. Um, so grateful for to you for sharing your wisdom and stories and personal things with us. We're, we're really grateful. Thanks again to all of you and God bless you on your Lenten journeys. And we'll hope to see you again soon. I just saw Susan Lardy's name in the in the chat. She is a former prioress at, uh, at in Bismarck, the Annunciation Monastery in Bismarck. One of the first men I met, actually. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I promise everyone I'm saving the chat. So all your personal messages to Mike and Kathleen, I promise I will pass on. Alrighty. Well, thanks again. Good good night to you in Hawaii, and good night to you in Utah, Mike. Good night, everybody. Stay well. Take care. Thank you.